Darcy's Law is the first step to understanding the physics of percolation. It was first derived directly from observations to describe how a fluid flows through a porous medium such as ground coffee when placed in a cylindrical container as illustrated at the... Oh, hey everyone! Today, we're gonna gear up to talk about something that a lot of you have been asking about. Flat bottom drippers versus cone drippers. talk today about the differences between flats and cones, which is better, which is worse, which is best for you, which is not best for you, or if we can even tell those differences. So instead of making you read something as convoluted and highly esoteric as the physics of filter coffee, which actually I recommend you buying and reading since it's great by Dr. Jonathan Gagne, but I'm going to go ahead and I've absorbed some of this information. I'm gonna regurgitate some of it for you, along with a study that was conducted at the University of California at Davis. It started in like 2017. They published it in about 2019. Thank you, Hugo, for taking the book away. But before we get into that, I'm gonna ask that you would take a quick second, hit the like, hit the subscribe on this video. Those things I cannot tell you enough how much they help me uh, with driving my video on the algorithm, helping me with subscribers, all that stuff really helps me. I would appreciate it. Begging, begging you, but you love him now, baby. All right, that was weird. First, I'm gonna discuss the results of this massive uh, test survey type thing that was done by UC Davis, headed up by the likes of Peter Giuliano out in California. The study was uh, funded by Breville because they have their precision brewer and it comes with both a flat bottom filter and a semi-conical filter. And they were wanting to know if there were objective differences between the two that you could actually trace scientifically, chemically, etc. They set up over three weekends this massive test with over 100 participants that are non-expert tasters. Every weekend, they tried nine to 10 coffees. Overall, over these three weekends, they hit 29 coffees, 118 different people. So over 3,000 coffee samples were served. And they, of course, had a lot of different methodology on how they were to approach this, but we won't get into that. I'll link it below if you're curious about um, how they got into it. They kind of finalized the top six things that really affected the perception of flavor to the majority of these people tasting it. And of course, they were they were erring on the side of things that were st statistically significant. So to begin, I'm going to say what was not statistically significant was brew temperature. So they only tested in these uh, specific temperatures, 87 degrees, 90 degrees, and 93 degrees centigrade. People weren't really recognizing the differences between temperatures. So that's not even really a part. They, out of the six variables, they had that as the lowest variable uh, because it just did not matter. They weren't able to find any type of change, which I made a video about that right here. I don't really play with 96 versus 97 or 95 versus 95.5, which I hear a lot of people debating about. Oh, this tasted better. Half a degree higher. No, it didn't. Get out of here. They do speculate that perhaps a larger variance in temperature would have been noticed by the people tasting, but at least between the 87 and 93, there were no real differences. But what they did find is the number one thing that these participants were tasting, were able to articulate the difference between, was by and far roast level. It didn't matter what the origin was. It didn't matter what the present acidity was and what concentration. It didn't matter about the brew recipe. Didn't matter about the brew temperature temperature, the grind size, or anything, the first thing to do is make sure you're getting the right roast level for you. Now, sadly, we don't really have a great way of uh, generalizing roast levels. For the most part, a dark coffee doesn't even have oils on it. That would be, for me, like a different conception of coffee. And so it, like for me, I would have to say oily dark. So for people who have oils on their beans, that's a darkness that doesn't really even live on my spectrum. So that's like super, super dark in, for me and for where I live. And a lot of people are like that. Dark to them or charred or anything like that may not even be to the point of what a lot of you are drinking, which is absolutely fine. If you like really dark coffees, you like the woody, the ashy, the, you know, the, the tobacco-y, the smoky, that type of coffee, that's valid. If you're on the other end of the spectrum, you like the really light, the fermenty, the floral, whatever it might be, that's completely valid. If you like really, really thin types of coffees where it's a really low TDS, that's valid. If you like really thick, chewy coffees, that's valid. There is no such thing as one recipe, one coffee, one style of brewing to rule them all. They took coffees, they had like nine that they would set up. You would have three different TDSs and three different extractions. Extraction yields were 16%, 20%, and 24%. The TDSs were 
1, 1.25, and 1.5, there was a greater ability across the participants to distinguish between lower and higher TDS and find their preference there than there was between 16, 20, and 24% extraction yield. So the extraction yield actually paled in comparison to TDS. Now that doesn't mean that the extraction yield meant nothing. It just means that there was a higher correlation between people picking specific cups when it came to concentration than it did extraction. Now, yes, that study did focus on the semi-conical brewer and the flat bottom brewer of the precision brewer, but I think we can extrapolate the data and the, the kind of conclusions to fit somewhat the conical brewer itself. So something like a flower Kono V60, et cetera. And same can be said about a drip coffee with the flat bottom versus something like the April, the Stag, the Aurea. The second most important thing was your brew recipe, not your pour pattern, not the pour pattern, not the temperature, not, not any of that but your ratio essentially. So more coffee or less coffee to a given amount of water, which essentially is the concentration, right? Then the third most important thing was actually the, the basket itself. So whether it was semi-conical or flat, all things staying the same, same, same grind size, same temperature, same pulses, same everything, people were able to distinguish pretty, pretty regularly between a flat bottom brewer and a semi-cone brewer. Then after that, you had grind size. So they found in their testing, people were more easily able to tell the difference between the basket geometry versus different grind sizes of the same coffee. I don't change grind size that much with pour overs unless it's like a big change. I, I, I understand a lot of people want to have this insane granularity and believe that it does a ton to their cup. I've never really noticed that. And instead, I tend to focus on some other variables and kind of keep that static when it comes to pour overs. There's probably some methodological flaws throughout this test that can be worked out with future iterations of this, but I do think it's a great place to start, especially when we're looking at what is potentially the most important thing when dialing in a coffee. So with the flat bottom brewer, they were tasting florals, chocolates, they were tasting uh, like dried fruits, they had like black tea and things like that. Whereas with the conical brewer, or the semi-conical brewer, they tasted more citrus, berry, sharp acidity. Uh, sometimes they would say it was a little uh, like brown roast, uh, maybe a little astringent in comparison to the flats. So these were the most common kind of phrases used when describing cups that came from either of these, obviously blindly. Are there issues in some of the methods? methodology? Sure. Do I know about the coffees they used? No. So honestly, it could be with those types of coffees, these are the results. Maybe if we had a wider span of different styles of coffee, it could be different because I know that one of the big things that they said about their light coffees that they had, they did a light, a medium, and a dark. So they were switching out samples often. Uh, on the light, a common uh, note that was given is fermenty, which makes me think that they were using heavily processed coffees for the lightly roasted coffees because I don't think a really lightly roasted uh, washed coffee is going to be very fermenty, but that's beside the point. So at the beginning, I was reading an excerpt about Darcy's Law, and that is an important equation when looking at water flowing through any of these drippers over here. So Jonathan Gagne talks about it, and he kind of messes with the equations in order for them to, for them to fit different drippers and to take into account coffee inside of it. But before we get into that, let's take a look at some of these different drippers and some of the peculiarities between them. So we're going to start with cone drippers. Most of us know the V60, the Hario V60, it's very famous. A lot of times these equations are assuming kind of smooth ridges and unperturbed flow through the, 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 the cylinder itself, uh, which this is obviously a cone, but you can manipulate the formula to, to, to take into account a cone shape as opposed to a cylinder. But if we look inside, we have these ridges. Now you may be asking, what are those ridges for? It's very simple. When you put a filter inside of here, the ridges are gonna push the filter off the side, which gives more surface area for the coffee to go through. Now, what that obviously means is wherever these ridges are pushing the filter off, there's now a gap between the filter and the wall, which will allow water and coffee to make it through and go around the bed of coffee, which is commonly referred to as bypass in brewing. This is an obvious uh, phenomenon that happens. There are people who put push against it, but something that uh, is very convincing is Gagne realized that if he were to map this out against Darcy's law, which would assume 
assume that it was uh, that water was going through without bypass. Uh, it should be a linear style of an equation if graphed out. But what he realizes, the more water you pour, if you put a column of water over the bed of, I believe he did eight centimeters in his uh, study where he was measuring the output, uh, the flow rate output, he noticed that uh, whereas Darcy's law was like this on a graph, just very linear, what was happening when he poured that much water in is as he was pouring water, the speed of the outfall increased rapidly, exponentially almost, which shows that there is water coming out of other places that D D Darcy's law doesn't account for. And so this kind of shows that the more water you put above your bed, the more potential bypass is going to occur. Now, where it occurs, how much it occurs in what space is not really knowable, at least at this point, but we do know that bypass will happen. So again, what that means is if you have your cone dripper and you have coffee right here, water goes into the coffee and it starts to flow through. But as it builds up over the bed, it's gonna wanna go through the filter and because there's negative space behind the filter between that and the wall, it can go behind it, go around the filter itself and exit the bottom. Now I know that you know when you look at a cone filter, and when you look at this, you wanna think that everything kinda of comes out just right here. But if that were the case, you would have a stalled brew so quickly that it would take you 15 minutes to drain. That's not nearly enough surface area for the water to escape the filter. The filter goes all the way up to the top of the wall, meaning you can use more surface area if needed. As you fill the cone up more and more, more of that water is going to be bypassing, which gives you a nice fast flow rate, but it doesn't really give you a very even extraction. Now, that being said, you're not gonna get much more of an even extraction in something like the Aurea or the Stag X or the April because flat bottom drippers have problems on their own. So if we're looking at them side by side, when you have something like a cone dripper, you have water that's going down through the middle and it tends to kind of favor the middle as it's going through and extracting because the mass gets smaller and smaller. So the middle gets extracted more than the edges for the most part. So you have a really nice gradient from north to south on the V60 where it's not as even from side to side. It's more even from top to bottom. But when you get something that's flat bottom, so it's completely flat on the bottom and you have a more truncated bed, what you're gonna get is much more even extraction on top and there's gonna be a gradient going down. What happens there is water's hitting the top of a flat bottom brewer and then you now are extracting the rest of the bed with coffee because there's nowhere else for it to kind of go around. However, where, when you have this cone, the concentration of the coffee gets less and less as you go down and it's easier for the middle to extract. So you have two different extraction dynamics going on. And when you think about it, even if they extract, if, even if the evenness of extraction, once you look at all of it and you kind of quantify each level as extra extracted, medium extracted, less extracted, even if they have the same amount in both, they're going to give you different flavor profiles. And that's because you're going to be extracting different parts of each part of the coffee differently. But let me try to explain that just a bit. Whenever we are extracting more in the center, obviously, as you're going down, the water is picking up extractants, solubles, and is going to continue extracting down here in the middle. It's gonna be at a different phase of extraction by the time it's getting extracted with water that already is uh, saturated. And whereas with this one, the majority of that top layer is getting heavily, uh, heavily uh, extracted, and as it goes down, it's extracting with extract. So you have two different styles of extraction going on even if they hit a similar extraction yield, which is what the study we mentioned earlier confirmed. Now, if we look again at another cone, just to kind of understand the filter to the wall dynamics, this is the Kono, a very old, very traditional dripper. It's smooth on the top part and then has ridges at the bottom. So what this means is if you have, if you sit, situate the paper filter really well, you're gonna get complete suction against the smooth walls. And then down here is where the filter is gonna stick off of the wall. So you're gonna have most of that bypass or partial bypass more like down here. Up here, water can't get around the bed. So this would be a lower bypass option than this. But when you think about it, this is gonna have a lot more surface area for the coffee to, to for the fines to be absorbed into and to kind of stick to uh, as the water's going down. So it has a, a, essentially a higher capability of fines absorption because it's using more of the filter, more of the surface area before releasing. In the Kono, of course, you just have this bottom part where the coffee is actually escaping. So you're gonna get a slower brew in a Kono than you would a V60 because of this flat surface here, okay? now. 
The flower is another option where it has kind of like finger width grooves in here, but it's giving you essentially a similar thing as the V60, whereas the V60, however, kind of gives you a spiral type of pattern, which is kind of moving the liquid in a spiral way. This one kind of just pushes it straight down as these petals or kind of finger-like indentions uh, are, are pushing the liquid down past the bed as well. So both of these are gonna give you a really quick brew. You're gonna have kind of uncontrollable bypass, but there are ways to mitigate that. A very important thing that a lot of people overlook when they're doing pour overs is how their filter is situated. Not wetting your filter is a big mistake. By the way, I recommend just dousing it with uh, your faucet water. That way it situates it really well with water weight, kind of pushing it into all the crevices. You can actually lessen bypass by doing that in these types of brewers. You're still gonna have some, but you're gonna be able to really push it against those walls with that water. But I'm not telling you to rinse your filter because it helps with paper taste. I'm telling you, you're not gonna have consistency from brewing to brew if you put a dry paper filter in there and you start brewing. You're gonna have folds happening as it's getting wet. You're gonna have differences in the bypass. You're gonna have differences in the flow. Now, something that has been recently discussed online is could I take like a blade grinder or a cheap grinder and sift out the really small particles and essentially have the same style of grinds or of grounds that a really nice grinder has? The answer to that is no. The interaction of the burrs or the blades with the beans are producing the different types of particles. Some grinders give you rougher particles than others which are going to affect the flow rate in different ways. Others are gonna give you more spherical or more elongated or just different styles of grounds that are gonna be fit in here. Now, when you think about it, if you have parts of the bed that have a lot of fines or a lot of funky uh, funky uh, shaped particles, then water's gonna flow through those areas differently than other areas of the bed, which is going to cause channeling. Yes, there's channeling in every coffee extraction ever. It doesn't matter what your bed looks like. It doesn't matter if your espresso extraction looks beautiful. There's no sprays, there is always uneven flow through the bed regardless. A more even flow through the bed will give you a more even extraction. So I always tell people when dialing in pour overs or espresso, start coarser and go finer until you find what you like. Because the more coarse you can ground, the more uh, unperturbed flow the water can experience, the more even the extraction, likely the better cup of coffee you're going to get. But if you have a really nice grinder, obviously you can go finer and finer without giving much perturbation to that flow but it's still better to go coarser in order to achieve the cup that you're wanting to achieve. Brew time and the brew temperature were the bottom variables. People were not able to tell the difference between a six minute brew and a three minute brew. It just didn't matter. The only issue with the long brew times is if you have a lot of channeling going on, which of course you can't really know. So grinding coarser is always your best bet, especially when you have a cheaper grinder. It's always better to grind a bit coarser. Flat bottom brewers. Flat bottom brewers, you get those frilly styles of filters like the Kalita filter, the Stag filter, things like that that have frills around the edges. Now, the reason for this is twofold. First, it's much easier to make those styles of filters to fit in here. Otherwise, how are you gonna make a filter to fit other than one you have to fold yourself? So you can take just a normal circle filter and they have machines that crimp them and it's very easy. You just fit straight in, wet it, and you go. The other thing is, is those are used in labs often to filter things out. The thing is, is in labs, they don't need evenness of filtration in the same way that you do in coffee. So those filters I actually despise. They promote a lot of bypass. And when you pour around those edges, those flower edges, you're going to bypass. Whatever doesn't hit the coffee is bypassing the bed. There's been a trend in recent years to fit other styles of filters into these brewers themselves. Or you created, you know, the negotiator, which is a tool that you kind of put in and twist and it, and it fits, it shoves a filter in there and fits it against the walls really well. Now you're never going to get no bypass by using a negotiator. You'll still have minimal bypass, but that's actually okay. You have different hole patterns on the bottom, and this is kind of what dictates the flow rate coming out. Because of course, whenever you wet your filter, since it's flat, the filter is going to get stuck to the bottom. And then that's the only release points that we have are these little slits right here and the hole in the center. The more open surface area we can have, the better. Or if we can situate the filter onto something that will hold it away from clogging it, we 
can open up the surface area more. So I know that Jonathan Gagne has suggested using a T-mesh. The April have these ridges inside to keep the filter from clogging that hole. And that way, instead of having just this surface area to release, you have the whole bottom of your filter, as well as maybe the sides if they're not connected to the walls. With the Stag X, you have these teeny tiny holes. And because their perforations are very small, if it's seated perfectly, it will cover these holes. And then literally your only surface area is this hole plus this hole plus this, 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 this. All of that combined is a tiny, tiny, tiny surface area for water to escape, which can stall or choke your brew. You need something holding the filter up in order to allow the maximum surface area for water to flow through properly. Increasing the weight of your water, the, the height of your water column, will also increase the weight, which can both compact the bed and it can increase the flow rate because you have more weight pushing it through. If you have uh, grounds that are coming out with a lot of fines in it, it may not be ideal to pour a massive water column because those can smoosh together a lot easier if you have a very wide particle distribution. It's easier for grounds to kind of fit close up next to each other, compress more, and disallow water from going through. Nicer grinders is not as big of a deal. Some people assume that if you have like a wider um, distribution, like a, a wider brewer, you'll get a faster uh, drawdown, and you will with a constant constant weight of coffee inside of a constant dose. But if you increase the dose in order to make it uh, efficient in extraction, then you're gonna have the same drawdown if you were to um, systematically decrease it. So let's say let's say we have a three centimeter bed in this Aurea here, and then we increase the Aurea to something this size, and we get a three centimeter bed again, you're gonna have the same drawdown in both one. That, that's what Darcy's Law dictates, and that's also what just happens in, in real life. Um, assuming everything the same, right? The percentage of fine etc etc when we made sure we had that minimum bed depth I put a kind of a nest in the center to really help uh, quickly saturate all of those grounds uh, in keeping with again uh, what Gagne suggests in his book and then I brewed them the same exact way with the same flow rate the same pulses the same time same t everything everything's the same right here I have the three cone and here I have the three flats and so on the bottom of the flats is this marker on the bottom of this is nothing there's going to be and one of these will be two flats one cone the other one will be two cones one flat makes sense don't listen if you don't like slurping because i'm about to go to slurp city i swear i think this is right i'm wrong aren't i uh this was a lot harder than i thought it was going to be i've done these in the past and they weren't this hard this one however was v hard i think these are flat and these were cones this section seemed easier because these two were really bright acidity and up to this one it just tasted muted the this was harder and i'm very confident this is the one that has the two flats i'm thinking it's these two but with the with the two flat bottoms or the flat or what i'm assuming is the flat profile is not as bright not as acidic more rounded more uh chocolatey more sweetness these seemed like that but they kind of all melded together and it was kind of a crapshoot so we'll go ahead and check these out that's a flat bottom and that is a cone so that's that is the flat that's flat, so that means these are definitely cones. I don't even have to check. I just measured the TDS of both of these samples. I took a sample at the beginning to let them cool. I didn't want to know the TDSs prior to tasting so it wouldn't mess with my mind, but I just measured them and they were both identical down to the hundredth using a VST refractometer. That's crazy. The fact of the matter is they did taste different. So it's obvious that different components are being extracted differently in each of them. The ones that both Ugo and I were able to differentiate were the cones. We did pull those out and paired them both. So we both were able to tell when it was two cones versus a flat, that it was, it was an apparent change like that was that was an easy change uh, it's when it was two flats and a cone that made it a little difficult because the two flats kind of uh, I don't know maybe it messed with our palate may I don't I don't want to speculate or we just suck at tasting but what I do know is they extracted essentially at the same exact extraction yield the same exact TDS which is crazy because we use the same recipe in two different drippers but that shows that the, the extraction is kind of similar going on as far as the hitting of different parts of the bed the biggest difference is how that extraction is occurring because of the shape of the bed if you're at home and you have a flat and a, and, a, and a cone, I would highly suggest you doing this brew or this test, doing this everything the same, just pick a grind size, pick a recipe, and just stick to it on both. And if you can, try to use the same filter paper. I just took a circular piece of paper, 
like so, a lab piece of paper, and I made it fit in the flat bottom, made it fit in the cone brewer, so that I could have the same porosity of paper filter for the brew itself. The biggest thing I think we can take away from it, more objectively than the flavor notes they attributed to both the flat and the cone, because I, I, I take issue with some of the flavor notes there. Instead of that, because that's more granular, that's a little bit more, I think you need more professional tasters for that. But what we can for sure take away from that, in my opinion, are those variables that they said in the matter of importance. The top importance, regardless of what you're brewing with, is gonna be your roast level. The second most important is gonna be your recipe or essentially your ratio, your concentration, your TDS. And then the third most important is going to be the basket geometry, so the brewer itself. So for us, those were the same TDS. They were hard to differentiate. Fourth is grind size. So take into account your basket shape, your ratio, and your roast level before you think about changing your grind size. And then you have brew time, and then you have brew temperature. All right, so let's keep those in order of importance right there. If you think that there's something different, let me know below because I'm going based off this study and based off of some personal experience. That's kind of what I've observed. I don't really change basket geometry as much. Maybe I will do it more often now, but I'm curious what your thoughts are. Is this video helpful? Are you gonna integrate some of those things into your workflow? Are these things that you have noticed? Generally, what I've noticed is just more balanced brews out of flat bottoms, more acidic and stratified brews out of cones, but does this change your thoughts on that? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks again for watching. Make sure you hit that like and the subscribe. If you enjoy my content, it all really helps. My Patreon's below, check that out. But anyway, I hope that you brew something tasty today and cheers.